the Mishcon Academy Digital Sessions. Welcome everybody, I'm Annabelle Thomas, I'm your host for today. Thank you very much for joining this Mishcon Academy Digital Session. Dominic Grieve QC, thank you so much for joining us today, finding the time, we're really grateful. You're talking to a room stuffed with lawyers and of course before you became an MP you had a flourishing career at the bar. What made you decide to leave the lovely world of law to serve in Westminster? Uh, when I was at university it was a very difficult time politically, it was the mid-70s, there was a feeling that um, there had to be some national renewal. So as a conservative at university it was quite an e exciting time and that's when I got my interest in politics and by 97 I was married, I had small children and actually my career at the bar was going so pleasantly as far as I was concerned that my ambition to go into the House of Commons was starting to tail off and indeed my wife and I went on holiday at Easter 97 and I said to her you know I'm going to give up trying to get into the House of Commons, there's about to be an election, I haven't been selected and uh, I regret to say that five days later I was the candidate for Beaconsfield and four weeks later I was the MP. I've got a very clear recollection of you becoming MP for Beaconsfield because I was a teenager at the time. How do you think today's parliament is, is sort of comparing with the early days when you started in 97? There are clearly far more rules now about what is acceptable behaviour from a member of parliament. So in a way an MP is helped I think much more today about what is acceptable and what is not. I don't think that we are witnessing some spectacular decline. I, I realise that Parliament took a huge hit over the whole issue of uh, expense allowances and I'm afraid did Parliament and has still done Parliament a lot of reputational damage. And in terms of the, the, the current MPs in Parliament, who do you think is there now who is who is really someone to watch who is doing what an MP should and exercising independent thought and judgment. Clearly, if you're on the opposition benches, you're pretty unfettered about what you do. You are going to have to follow the opposition whip most of the time. But even if you don't, the chances of it being held against you with a government with a large majority is pretty remote. So there are lots of Labour MPs, I can think of Yvette Cooper, Chris Bryant, who, who show huge independence. I mean, I'm just selecting two because I happen to work closely with them over issues on Brexit. Government backbenchers, well, I think there are still a few around. Clearly, when you are a government backbencher, then the risks to your career, if you depart markedly from the government line, well, I'm afraid the reality is it may not do you any good. When you're senior, you can probably do anything you like up to a point, although there is clearly a point by which you can't go further, or otherwise I wouldn't have been chucked out of the Conservative Party. One of the most important independent offices of state is that of the Attorney General and you served from from 2010 for four eventful years. What was your proudest achievement as AG? What was the moment you looked back on with greatest affection? I'm very pleased that I did what I did over Hillsborough. It led to the quashing of the Hillsborough inquests and it led to the subsequent inquiry and the prosecutions. I'm also pleased that with the help of the then DPP Keir Starmer we succeeded in keeping the uh, Crown Prosecution Service afloat in a time of major change. I'd like to think that when I left office, we were actually had a more effective organisation than when we started. The third thing um, I think that I have a good, uh, I feel pleased about was that I took on the issue of contempt of court. My predecessors had essentially given up on prosecuting newspapers for contempt of court where their coverage was clearly undermining a fair trial system where you have trial by jury. I decided that we had to do something because it was getting out of control and I was able to do something about it and I tried to link that with a real outreach program and say to the press look I want you to be able to report but you've got to understand the framework. The role the Attorney General I think came into, into sharp focus in recent weeks with um, the Dominic Cummings issue and the current AG uh, commenting on Twitter. Is it a debate you think she should have weighed into? I try not to comment on my successors, but no, attorneys general should not tweet. If they're going to tweet, they should not tweet about what is something which is capable of turning into a prosecutorial decision. Talking of um, social media and the, and the last election, this might be a good time to move on to, on to that election campaign. And obviously you were 
in an extraordinary position, standing as independent and trying to take on the majority you had built up. What, what, were, the, what were the issues on the doorstep? Was it all nationalist issues or was it constituency issues too? There were constituency issues on the doorstep, but it's also right to say that for the most part on the doorstep, the key issues were about Brexit, uh, the extent to which Jeremy Corbyn was or was not somebody who could become prime minister, and about the future of the country. I, I never had illusions about the election. Um, if you go and stand in an extremely conservative area, which you've represented for many years, the idea that your constituents are suddenly going to reverse their voting patterns out of loyalty, personal loyalty to you, is, uh, I think, a little bit fanciful. What I did want to ensure is that we had a proper debate. Of course, you obviously vociferous campaigner in the campaign to remain. Did the referendum result surprise you? If you'd asked me that question just before the referendum had started, I think my reply would have been, I think we will win it. I saw the writing on the wall about halfway through. The narrative of the Remain campaign was, I'm afraid, poor. It was all about, you must vote to stay in because otherwise the economic consequences are going to be so bad. Whereas for me, it's about Britain's place in the world, it's about the security of the European continent and our role within it. One of the drivers to our doing joining was the belief that bringing European countries together in common endeavour would be massively beneficial to our citizens. And in truth, so it has proved to be. But we didn't have that narrative. The negotiations about our withdrawal are continuing in the midst of a pandemic. There's been no request for an extension. How do you see things panning out from here? I think there is material to do some sort of deal, but my belief, I think, is we're either going to end up with no deal or we're going to end up, as I think Sir Ivan Rogers has said, with a series of cheap and dirty deals, was I think how he described it. The other thing which I think we fail on the whole to read into this is about the EU's approach to it. There will be some people who will say, let's do them down. And the obvious area to do us down is in our services. Like all negotiations, is there goodwill? If there is, then we may come to some arrangement. But I think the risk is quite high that we may end up leaving with, with no effective long-term relationship of any kind at all. Where do you think that would leave sort of the future of, of the union? All this is destabilising. As I mm. keep on saying, my delightful constituents who voted for Brexit in the name of tradition, but what they've actually done is, is to perpetrate revolution. And revolutions have their own momentum, they devour their own children, and they carry you to places where you never expected you were going to have to go, and they're immensely difficult to stop. Do you think Johnson is capable of bringing things together? I obviously have in mind his extraordinarily chequered past. I have expressed myself in quite strong terms about the Prime Minister. He's highly entertaining, and he is also, um, in his own way, very clever. But I do sometimes wonder if he has the right personality to be the Prime Minister, or indeed he showed the right personality to be the Foreign Secretary. He's described him as having unleashed a tide of invective and mendacity. And that was before the Dominic Cummings scandal but did you what, what did you think as you saw his story unravel and change about the trip to Barnard Castle? In the three months after the Prime Minister became Prime Minister and Dominic Cummings became his Chief of Staff and Principal Advisor, the Prime Minister's office turned into a propaganda department prepared to say things which I thought went far beyond the norm even I would expect in robust democratic politics. It included telling blatant untruths about what the government was doing, blatant untruths about the government's behavioural intentions. And then, on a personal basis, I was struck by the fact that an unnamed briefer at number 10, but an official government briefer, said that we were being helped by the French or foreign governments to draft the Ben Act. The consequence of that briefing was that in the next 72 hours, the death threats flowed in, picked up by a number of the tabloid press all saying we were traitors. If a government has lost its own reputation for behaving properly, it becomes much harder for the prime minister or any other minister to step in and calm things down because they themselves have contributed to this use of language. So to that extent, I was unimpressed with what I saw at the end of last year. And something else you uh, asked for, repeatedly in Parliament was the report on Russian interference in elections to be released. Now I know you can't comment at all on what is in that report but could you comment on why you think we're still waiting? We carried out 
a report as a committee. This is a cross-party committee. It was ready from our point of view in March last year. It has to go through a redaction process with the intelligence agencies and the Central Security Secretariat, which is absolutely legitimate. And we came to a resolution in early October where we had a document that could be published. Normally, the Prime Minister's office signs it off and there is an unwritten understanding with the Prime Minister's office that it's normally done in 10 days. Everybody knew in early October that there might be an early election and early elections are disastrous for the work of the Intelligence Committee because essentially all the work falls off the edge of a cliff. So the Prime Minister and his office knew perfectly well that if it didn't come out before Parliament rose, it couldn't be published at all. We waited 10 days, nothing happened. We made inquiries that seemed to be talking to a brick wall. And that's why I raised the point I did uh, as a point of order in the House of Commons. The reply I got was, oh, well, it normally takes up to six weeks. Well, that's not true. It normally takes up to six weeks before the committee publishes the report. So I'm afraid that's why I said I thought the explanations provided by the Prime Minister at the time or the Prime Minister's office were bogus because they simply didn't stack up. The committee folds. It can't be published. Um, the election takes place the day after the election, astonishingly. Number 10 says, oh, actually, we're now quite happy to have it published. But of course, it can't be published for months because you don't have an intelligence and security committee. So I'm afraid we're going to have a situation where I suspect now we're not going to see this report until possibly the autumn of this year. What sort of Brexit deal do you believe Dominic Cummings would like? My impression from reading and listening to what he says is that as an advisor he is a genuine believer in massive deregulation, low tax, uh, a libertarian instinct as to the UK's role and that is really taking the, the Brexit revolution to its ultimate conclusion. I doubt very much that he is successful in doing that because I think that Ultimately, that is a view which is shared in the United Kingdom by a very limited number of people, a very limited number of members of parliament. I, I just don't see that revolution working. And if it were to come anywhere close to working, then the chances are it will deliver a Labour government very quickly. What do you think about the rise of populism in both the US and the UK? And do you think that eventually intellectualism and common sense will prevail? So Trump is certainly an extreme example, but I also agree that we have it here. There's no doubt that there's a rise in populism. One way of grappling with it, but it's always about taking a risk, is about being more honest. There is something about being straight with people, including straight about the limits of your own capacities to take action. And far from it showing you to be weak, I think ultimately it has the capacity to show politicians to be strong. The levels of diversity in thinking and beliefs is missing. What damage do you think this will do to the UK in the long run? I think we can all agree there's substantial work to be done. Yes, we need to do much more. But I, perhaps there I'm slightly more, perhaps I'm over optimistic. My own profession, over 50% of entrants are women and the diversity element is very substantial. But what is more worrying is whether in fact those coming in are achieving their full potential. And trying to skew the system to bring people is one of the most difficult things. We, you know, we argue that we have a judiciary which is appointed on merit. But ultimately, your ability to show merit is dependent in many cases on your education. And white males may well have an advantage in respect of their education, particularly if they've been educated privately. We can't escape these things. And it's very hard to change. I would be staggered and, and disappointed if in 20 years time, we don't find that there are in fact a substantial number of ethnic minority judges in the High Court and above. I think there will be because they're there, you can see them, you meet them. Very much hope you're right. So grateful to you for coming to speak to us. Thank you so much. It's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure to do it. The Mishcon Academy Digital Sessions. To access advice for businesses that is regularly updated, please visit mishcon.com.